Good happy Wednesday evening. I'm Riley King, and welcome to your Wednesday evening edition of WRMK News 12. Let's get started with your evening newscast right now. First up. New Deal recommends nine-year in prison for former bus driver who stalked a boy. Let's take a listen to that report from WMUR News 9. Michael Chick admitted stalking an eight-year-old boy on his bus route. In their sentencing recommendation, the U.S. Attorney's Office notes that Chick also followed the boy and his family, photographed them in public, placed GPS tracking devices on their vehicles, and went to the family's home in the middle of the night, even taking photographs of the inside of their home through the windows. The federal sentencing guidelines normally call for a three-year sentence, but the U.S. Attorney's Office notes this case is far from normal. While there is no evidence of any sexual assault. The sentencing recommendation notes several pairs of children's underwear were located in the defendant's room. The U.S. Attorney's Office is also recommending that Chick participate in a sex offender treatment program while in prison, and that if his probation office deems is necessary, continue that treatment once he's released. Chick would also be prohibited from entering Rockingham County, where his victim lives. The defense says they are in agreement with the government with one exception. Upon release, the government wants Chick to abide by a three-year curfew from nine at night to six in the morning. The defense noting a previous court ruling restricting the defendant to his place of residence during the evening and nighttime is necessary to protect the public from crimes he might commit during his hours, adding, in this case, the crimes were committed during the day. Both the prosecution and defense also noted Chick has no previous record. While the victim's family initially rejected the plea deal of six years as inadequate, the U.S. Attorney's Office says the family supports the nine-year sentence, again noting it spares their son the trauma of having to testify. Ray Brewer, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that report. Custer announces she won't seek re-election in November. Let's take a listen to that report from WMUR News 9. Twisted tea is a refreshing hard iced tea made with real blue tea. Keep it twisted. Well, Gene, Congresswoman Custer has always said this isn't something she wants to do forever, but I think it's safe to say that few saw the end of her career in Washington coming so quickly. This is quite the shock announcement that she pulled off this morning, and that announcement sends a shock wave through New Hampshire politics. She's represented the 2nd District in Washington since 2013, winning six consecutive elections. In recent years, as she has climbed the ranks of seniority in the House, she's seen her power grow, becoming the chair of the New Democrat Coalition, a centrist caucus that's become a key player in this narrowly divided Congress. While Representative Custer has championed several issues during her tenure, she's also known for stepping forward to share her personal stories, both as a survivor of sexual assault in her youth and also being very candid about her struggle with post-traumatic stress after being trapped in the House chamber during the January 6th attack on the Capitol. As for why she is stepping away now, she says it's just time for a new stage in her life. Uh, I spent a lot of time with my family this winter. We did a lot of skiing and traveling, and I realized I have a life. And um, my husband, Brad, has been very patient. I want to spend time with my sons as they're heading into their married lives and uh, hopefully grandchildren on the way um, one day. And I really want to lean in on helping my colleagues and these fantastic candidates that we've recruited. Custer says she does plan to stay involved in politics after she leaves office, but in a different capacity, as she noted there, helping to elect her fellow Democrats. Now, Custer's retirement is likely going to open the floodgates on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats coming forward to seek the NHE 2 seat. Now, with each consecutive election, CD2 has been considered less and less competitive as she's had that seat on lockdown, but now that it is an open seat, it is considered to be a competitive seat once again. Reporting live in Concord, Adam Sexton, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that report.
last two coal fired power plants in New England to close. Let's take a listen to that report from WMUR News 9. Hey guys, Merrimack Station here in Bow is one of the last two coal-fired power plants, not just here in New Hampshire, but in all of New England. Now the facility's owner, who also owns another facility out by Portsmouth, is announcing that both will close. In their place, Granite Shore Power plans to house green energy products. That includes plans for battery storage centers that could be tapped into during peak demand. That includes those brutally hot days in the summer, bitterly cold days during the winter when more people need to tap into the power grid to keep their houses at a comfortable temperature. Environmental advocates say this will usher in a new chapter in green energy for not just New Hampshire, but the entire region. Seeing uh, these plants now commit to closing and uh, ending coal-fired power in New England is, is really a big deal and, and moving us towards the clean energy economy that we need. Now, Schiller Station in Portsmouth, which has mostly been inactive in the last few years, is set to close its doors next year. Meanwhile, Merrimack will remain intermittently up and running for the next few years here in Bow. It is set to officially be retired in 2028. Live in Bow, Ross Ketchke, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that report. Guilford police search for man after Wendy's manager says customers assaulted him. Let's take a listen to that report from WMUR News 9. Steve, right now, police tell us they are still looking for that customer who they are identifying as the suspect in all of this. The manager, the victim in this, says there was a verbal altercation that led to a physical assault in a Wendy's drive through early this morning. This happened at around 8.30 this morning at the Wendy's on Lakeshore Road. The manager tells us the customer placed an order for food at the drive through window and then got into a verbal disagreement with him because he was going to have to wait for his food. The manager says he then went outside to take a picture of the suspect's license plate, where the two then got into a physical altercation, but police are not classifying this as a fight, saying the suspect assaulted the manager. The manager also says the suspect displayed a handgun before leaving the Wendy's. The manager had bumps and bruises after he was assaulted. He had a gun in his vehicle. It was like under his seat. Did he like show it to you? He like pulled it out and like he didn't pull the gun out of the case, but it was just like more of just like he was trying to intimidate me. Did he say something while he pulled the gun? It was like he was going to shoot me or something. And police tell us this was an isolated incident. They say right now there is no threat to the public. They say if found, this suspect could face criminal threatening and assault charges. They say they are still investigating this assault. We're live in Guilford tonight. Imani Fleming, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that report. Woman accused of a shooting man with a pellet gun. Let's take a listen to that report from WMUR News 9. Um, I will order preventative detention for this case. 34-year-old Caitlin Cook was ordered to be held in jail for allegedly shooting a man and leaving him with life-threatening injuries. However, it wasn't your typical firearm. If the weapon in question is a pellet gun, it is not is facing four felony charges. All of them include the use of a, quote, deadly weapon. Pellet rifle, as stated in paragraph 46 of the affidavit, the barrel of a pellet rifle has a warning on it, which I understand to say misuse or careless use may cause serious injury or death. Cook's attorney says Cook was acting in self-defense, using a pellet rifle to shoot the victim. According to court documents, the victim came to the tent Cook lives in in Healy Park and demanded drugs. She said no and told him to leave. The victim then threw a coffee maker at Cook and Cook threatened to shoot him. The victim told her to do so. She then did from about 10 to 15 feet away, and Cook's lawyer doesn't believe she's dangerous. She, she does not have any felonies on her record. That she's not does not have a history of committing any violent crimes. Now, the victim spent a couple of days in the hospital, but is currently in stable condition. As for Cook, she's due back in court in April. We're live here in the newsroom. Troy Lynch, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that report. 
Oyster River middle schoolers learn science behind the eclipse. Let's take a listen to that report from WMUR News 9. YouTube Premium is ad-free YouTube and background play. So you can watch... On April 8th, a rare celestial event will happen over New Hampshire skies. The last time New Hampshire was in the path of totality was 1959. Today, students in Durham got a hands-on lesson on the science behind this rare event. An eclipse is a really exciting event. Uh, anybody can observe it as long as they make sure they have some sort of safe method to do it, but you just go outside and it's happening. The entire state will see some kind of show, whether it be a partial or total eclipse. I thought it was really cool. Um, I didn't know, like, there was three different types of eclipses. Southern New Hampshire, including Durham, will see a partial solar eclipse with 95% coverage, and the crescent will get thinner and thinner, moving up the state to the path of totality. 95% sounds really cool. It will be decades before an event like this happens again. So Kesey wants these students to enjoy this moment, but to do so safely. As the sun, moon, and earth align, many will likely have their eyes on the sky for an extended period of time and that could be dangerous for your eyes you can't feel anything in the back of your eye so you won't know that you're causing the damage while it's happening but with the proper protection that can be avoided there are direct viewing methods where you look up at the sky using things like certified safe solar glasses or indirect viewing methods like making a cardboard pinhole projector or using household items like your colander and face your back to the sun and see the eclipse shadow and every student in the district will get a pair of solar glasses designed by a UNH student so they can watch history happen in their own backyard. In Durham, Kelly O'Brien, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that report. Manchester School District plans to use in-house transportation this fall. Let's take a listen to that report from WMUR News 9. Last year was a pretty rough one for families relying on bus service to and from Manchester schools. Workforce shortages and contract confusion with the district's two contractors, Student Transportation of America and Manchester Transit Authority, led to delays, crowding, and routes getting canceled. It was too much, and we know that we want students in our schools. Part of that is getting them to and from school on time. We knew we wanted to do better, so bringing transportation in-house seemed like a logical next step. On Monday, the school board approved a new $4 million plan that the district hopes will fix those problems and improve service. That the plan includes creating its own transportation department to keep everything in-house all under one roof. The superintendent says they're looking to hire a new management team and nearly 50 drivers. We're actively working with the union who represents the drivers. Uh, as soon as that gets to a, de uh, a more definitive place, we'll be looking at recruitment um, pushes out there in the community. We're looking at 46, and within the 46, um, because we're in active negotiations right now, we're feeling fairly strong um, as we go out of the gates on this work. And again, the district is hoping to get things up and running by fall. In the meantime, they will keep a contract with MTA to keep buses maintained here at this same facility. We're live in Manchester. Hannah Cotter, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that report. Craig rolls out abortion rights plan. Let's take a listen to that report from WMUR News 9. Almost two years after the 2022 Dobbs Supreme Court decision, abortion remains a key issue at the state level for voters. Democrats at the State House have been working unsuccessfully to repeal New Hampshire's ban on abortions after 24 weeks. Now, in the Democratic primary for governor, Joyce Craig is putting forward her own plan to go much further if she wins the corner office. This is the most comprehensive policy plan for reproductive rights that the state of New Hampshire has ever seen. Among several priorities, she's called to use the state's Medicaid funding to cover the cost of abortions and to increase the reimbursement rate to providers. 
She wants to issue an executive order to make New Hampshire a safe haven for out-of-state women seeking abortions and establish a new Bureau of Reproductive Health Care within the Department of Health and Human Services. Right now, that doesn't exist. And we need to make sure women have access to comprehensive, honest information when it comes to reproductive freedom. This will be a major point of contention in the primary as Cindy Warmington has fought for reproductive rights on the Executive Council, and neither candidate wants to be outdone on the abortion issue in the eyes of likely Democratic voters. In Concord, Adam Sexton, WMUR News 9. Game nine moved our house. Woo, woo. Another reason to make Hannaford to go, your go to. Okay, and there you go on that report. Hopkins experts address bridge portions after collapse. Let's take a listen to that video from WBAL TV 11 News. <laughs> Well, bridge protections that could prevent a cargo ship from ever colliding. That was one of the topics that Johns Hopkins University experts addressed during a media briefing this morning. Investigative reporter Tolly Taylor joins us now live. And Tolly, these questions were focused on the protections surrounding the bridge piers. Yeah, right. When uh, the dolly slammed into the key bridge, it took out one of the bridge piers, causing the total bridge collapse. Some bridges across the country have fenders or protective barriers surrounding their piers to keep boats and ships away. Hopkins professor Benjamin Schaefer is a structural engineer, and he noted the key bridge only had very modest fenders for its piers, only strong enough to redirect a small fishing boat in his estimation. But he also said he's not sure that any modern protections would have been enough to withstand a direct hit from a ship the size of the Dolly. Could we build a, a Fort Knox, uh, you know, a, a nuclear bunker in front of every bridge? Uh, it's, it's structurally possible, but it's not economically feasible. Um, and so even in the most extreme uh, bridge protection systems uh, that we see um, at this point, I remain unconvinced that in a similar uh, incident that they would perform successfully. Schaefer says he doesn't refer to what happened to the key bridge as a collapse, calling it an infrastructure system failure because the bridge was destroyed. And he says when a new bridge is built to replace the key bridge, most of the necessary improvements won't be physical. There, there's the physical things that we should do in the new bridge, but it's it's probably the social things and many of the maritime changes that we might need to make to make the whole system uh, work successfully so we don't have another bridge strike. Now, U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg spoke about the ship at a news conference this afternoon at the White House, comparing its size to a small aircraft carrier. He also said the ship's weight is roughly 200 million pounds. For 11 News Investigates, I'm Tolly Taylor. Okay, and there you go on that report. And we are going to switch gears and let's go into sports right now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Riley King, and welcome to your evening edition of WRMK News 12 Sports Report. Let's get started right now. First up, Boston Bruins. They had a game last night, and the final score of the Boston Bruins game last night was Boston Bruins 4 and Florida Panthers 3. The Boston Bruins won the game last night. Congratulations, Boston. Boston Bruins. Boston Bruins are 42 to 16 to 15 and Florida Panthers are 46 to 21 to 5. Excellent job, Boston Bruins. And they play tonight at 7.30 p.m. against Tampa Bay Lightning. Let's go Bruins. Hopefully they can win tonight's game. And Boston Red Sox, they had a spring training game last night, and the final score of that game was Red Sox 4 and Texas Rangers 1. Red Sox won the game last night for their spring training game. Red Sox played tomorrow at 10.10 p.m. against the Maniers. It'll be a spring training game tomorrow night at 10 10 p.m. And Celtics, they play tomorrow night at 7.30 p.m. against Atlanta Hawks. Let's go Celtics. Hopefully they can win tomorrow night's game. And that is your sports report right here on WRMK News 12. Thank you for tuning in and watching. Have a great evening and good night. Okay, and uh, that's a look at your sports. 
And that is it for this evening edition of WRMK News 12 Evening Newscast. Thank you for watching. Have a great Wednesday evening. Good night and goodbye.